Industrial Revolution is a time in a country's history when it undergoes a rapid change from an agricultural to a factory-based economy. The first Industrial Revolution began in England around the year 1750 and proceeded over many decades to transform not only that country's landscape, but the entire fabric of her society as well. Let us step back in time and discover what caused these massive and unprecedented changes to occur in that small country. To picture England before the Industrial Revolution, we must imagine a nation that was the most powerful on earth and yet possessed no real factories. A country that had just one large city, London. For the most part, England was a quiet and lovely land of farms and rural villages, only the sounds of weather, of animals and the distant ringing of church bells broke the stillness of the landscape. Yet England was a land of great social inequality. A handful of aristocrats owned most of the land and possessed by right of birth nearly all of the incredible wealth it yielded. They built magnificent palaces for themselves and filled them with treasure. While an enormous lower class most of whom owned no land, struggled to survive, often paying rent to the wealthy landowners. These poor people sometimes faced severe malnutrition and even starvation. They usually died young. With this as a background, let us find out what great changes were to occur as a result of industrialization. The first industrial revolution began in England for several reasons. First, she possessed rich deposits of iron and coal, resources essential to industrialization. Second, England had many reliable sources of water power. And third, numerous colonies around the world supplied her with abundant raw materials, like this cotton. And at the same time, they provided an enormous captive market for her manufactured goods, like this cloth. These colonial markets helped to stimulate British textile and iron industries. And in the beginning, it was the wealth produced by these two industries that drove the Industrial Revolution. During the mid-18th century, the growing demand for goods such as the iron hand tool seen here resulted in greater competition among manufacturers. And as costs of production rose, Manufacturers sought new ways of meeting the increased demand for products without raising prices. In many ways, the story of the Industrial Revolution is a story of human ingenuity, of people finding new ways to use the sources of energy available to them, and to profitably link these sources of energy with marvelous new machines that could more efficiently perform tasks that in the past had required long hours of hand labor. Let us look at one example of how machinery can save labor in the grinding of grain into flour. The traditional way of grinding grain, a method still in use in some parts of North America, is to simply rub the grain between two stones. Ancient European people used similar methods of making flour until at some point, many centuries before the Industrial Revolution, it was discovered that the power of the wind could be captured and used to turn grinding stones. Likewise, it was discovered that a flowing stream could also be used to turn a water wheel that in turn could move the millstones. These mills for producing flour are some of the oldest factories, for they were placed home-based hand-powered power making, the more efficient and profitable means of production. Because of a growing demand for manufactured goods in the mid-18th century, some of the same techniques for using water power found in grain mills began to be adapted to many other purposes, and new types of factories were created. The most dramatic changes in manufacturing that occurred at that time were in the way the cloth was made. Before industrialization, cloth making was strictly a cottage industry, performed by people working at home under contract to cloth merchants. The cloth merchant would bring the cottagers raw fibers 
of wool, cotton, or flax. These fibers were then spun into thread on spinning wheels as shown here. Every part of traditional thread spinning, from feeding the fibers onto the spindle to pumping the treadles that turned the spinning wheel, relied totally on human energy. The same was true of weaving cloth from the spun threads on hand looms. Hand weaving was a slow, repetitive process, relying entirely upon human energy. Starting around 1760, the invention of several new and complicated machines truly revolutionized cloth making. And all of these new machines were rapidly adapted to use moving water as a source of power. The first new machine for the spinning jenny could do the work of 16 people working at 16 spinning wheels. A short time later, new, more advanced spinning machines were invented that could perform the work of thousands of hand spinners. These machines killed the cottage spinning industry forever. The home weavers were soon to meet the same fate as the spinners, as large new water-powered machines called power looms rapidly replaced hand weaving. Power looms roll threads at dazzling speeds that human hands could never hope to match. As the use of new water-powered machines for textile manufacturing became widespread across England, large factory buildings like Quarry Bank Mill near Manchester began to appear on the banks of streams to shelter both the machines and the workers who operated them. With the creation of factories, the way that people lived began to change. Since the machines were too large and complicated to be placed in a cottage, it became necessary for this new generation of workers to travel to the new factories for employment. This shift from home to factory-based work was to dramatically alter English society, as poor farm workers and unemployed weavers and spinners left countryside, seeing dependable employment in newly forming industrial centers. Factory work was much different from the system of cottage industry. Under the old system, cloth merchants had a fairly close relationship with their workers and generally took an interest in their well-being. But large factories and rigid production schedules did not allow for much familiarity between owners and workers. And factory work was more tiring than home manufacturing, even though the factories kept the same 12 to 14 hour work schedule, six days a week, that the cottage workers had followed. Factory work had greater production demands, it was very monotonous, and few breaks were allowed. Plus, work conditions in factories were much worse than in cottage settings. Many of the earliest factories, referred to by labor reformers as the dark, satanic mills, were noisy and dangerous places in which to work, full of dust and fumes that often resulted in permanent physical damage to workers. Children, robbed of their childhoods, worked long hours in the mills, and women and children were paid only a fraction of what the men were. Many mill owners believed that the lower classes had to be kept poor in order to make them industrious. But even though wages were low, at least workers could rely on them, so that they rarely faced the extreme poverty they had known in the past. Although the working classes did not at first share in wealth created by the Industrial Revolution, the middle and upper classes prospered, and great fortunes were made as wealth shifted from the hands of land-owning aristocrats to factory-owning capitalists. One famous social critic of the time, who worked to bring about changes in the law to benefit the poor working classes, was Charles Dickens. His books offer vivid portrayals of life during the First Industrial Revolution. And Karl Marx, a Dickens contemporary, who lived in England for much of his life, wrote his two famous books, Das Kapital and The Communist Manifesto, in response to the social injustices he witnessed as a result of industrialization. During the time of Marx and Dickens, many factories had switched to coal instead of water, the source of power. The problem with using water or wind to run machines was that they could be unreliable sources of energy. A windmill couldn't operate on windless days. And a water-powered factory came to a complete halt 
during dry spells. For this reason, a new invention called the steam engine came into wide use in factories. And because it used coal for fuel, it was no longer necessary to build factories next to rivers. Although steam engines had begun to be used to run machines as early as the 1720s, it wasn't until the late 1700s that steam power started to be used in factories really efficiently. A steam engine works like this. Water is heated by wood or coal in a boiler. As steam is produced, the pressure in the boiler increases. By turning a handle, the steam enters the engine through a valve. The steam pressure then pushes the piston down, which in turn moves a heavy flywheel. Then the piston is returned to its starting position as high pressure steam pushes on the other side of the piston. When the engine is running at full speed, the piston moves back and forth very rapidly. Pulleys or gears attached to the flywheel can then be used to run almost any kind of machine. The need for more coal and iron increased dramatically as orders for more manufactured goods poured into business offices. Coal was needed not just to run steam engines, but for iron making and heating. More iron was needed to make more machines and steam engines, as well as iron goods like tools and cookware. So it was that the Industrial Revolution's appetite for coal went hand in hand with its appetite for iron. The interdependence of iron and coal use can easily be seen here in this coal mine. Coal is lifted out of the pit by a steam engine. The steam engine uses coal for fuel and is made from iron parts cast in the ironworks nearby. Nearly all the machines of the Industrial Revolution were made mainly of iron and coke made from coal is a basic fuel burned melt the iron ore. Before improvements in transportation, factories were built in areas where iron and coal mines were close at hand. These areas, mines, factories and workers crowded together, developed into industrial cities, and they almost immediately became difficult places in which to live. Here, the water and air became terribly polluted, as dark clouds of smoke poured from factory chimneys, from ovens where coals converted into coke, and from the fireplaces in the simple homes of thousands of miners and factory workers. Everything was covered with a dark layer of soot. Industrial waste and sewage fouled the rivers and streams. And the land that only recently had been green and fertile was torn up as more and more mines and factories appeared, and new rows of workers' houses sprouted up in the nearby fields. These industrial towns were dreary, overcrowded, and unhealthy places to raise a family. But eventually, changes started to be made to benefit the workers. A handful of enlightened industrialists created a few model villas for workers, and these were a great improvement over how they had lived before. Later in the 19th century, many other social improvements followed. Laws banning labor unions were repealed, and child labor was outlawed. Although there were plenty of economic bad times, the working classes had reached a point where they sometimes had extra money to spend. In fact, they now made up a vast new market for the manufactured goods they helped produce. Wealth, it seemed, created more wealth. Free public schools were instituted all across England for the very first time, resulting in the first working class generation that was able to read and write. These new educational skills provided some young people with a ticket away from a dreary future in the mines and factories to better paying, less monotonous jobs. The rising prosperity that accompanied industrialization also brought improvements in transportation. First, the roads, that in the past were often little better than crude, muddy tracks, were improved to handle more traffic. And new bridges were constructed, some made entirely of iron for the very first time. As early as 1761, an intricate system of canals and locks began to be constructed, so that barges could carry fuel and raw materials from mines to factories. 
and finished goods from factories to city warehouses. As early as 1825, steam engines were being used to turn the wheels of locomotives that moved along steel tracks at the unheard of speed of 15 miles per hour. Also by that time, steam-powered ships were beginning to travel the seas, no longer dependent on the ever-changing winds. And late in the 19th century, as huge parts of North America and Europe complete their transition to an industrial society, steam-powered farm machines, from tractors to hay balers, revolutionized farming. And by the start of the 20th century, the United States had overtaken England to become the world's leading industrialized nation. From the 1880s through the first decades of the 20th century, many new and incredible inventions radically changed the way people lived. Horse and steam-powered vehicles were abandoned for more efficient, gasoline-powered vehicles run by internal combustion engines. Thomas Edison's phonograph brought music into the home, and motion pictures to the theaters, and his love brightened up the nights. The airplane allowed humans to fly through the air. And by using an assembly line of workers, Henry Ford was able to mass-produce automobiles so inexpensively as to make them affordable to average working Americans. This new world of the early 20th century arrived as a result of the first industrial revolution. It was busy, crowded, noisy, and exciting. In less than two centuries, a peaceful rural way of life had been replaced by a truly new style of living. And today, many parts of the world still await the coming of industrialization, with all its benefits and problems. As these new industrial revolutions take hold, traditional agricultural ways of life will be traded for the security of factory jobs, as quiet landscapes are transformed by the smoke, the noise, and the hectic pace of life that followed the first industrial revolution in England 250 years ago.